Okay, so so good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining. My name is Paul Nolan, and I'm director at Mersey Forest. And I'm going to uh, just do the introduction for the session today. First of all, um, amazing to see so many people having joined us. We're really grateful for you having come along to to listen to the discussion or the talk in the discussion today. Um, and you know, we you all know we've got a really challenging uh, set of targets to to achieve and some really interesting projects to deliver in the next few years and we're using these workshops as a way to make sure we we set off with um, really good ideas about how we make the best of this opportunity so this is the the agenda for this afternoon so i'm, I'm not going to take 10 minutes of the intro just a very quick intro for me i'm then going to hand over to to john uh, to take us through his his session and and hopefully have a really good discussion uh, about the, the work that John's going to describe as well. Um, so housekeeping, uh, we are recording the session. So just so that you, you know, and that, will, that recording will be made available. Uh, a PDF of the presentations will also be made available after, after today. Uh, John is going to break his presentation up so we can have a, a 10 minute break part way through. So a stretch, a, a cup of tea or whatever you wish to do during that period. Um, and then just some, some pleas from, from me, uh, mics and cameras off during pre John's presentation, um, just so that uh, we, we save bandwidth and we make it as effective as possible. Please don't use the chat uh, during the presentation because obviously the chat kind of pops up onto the presentations and can be distracting. Um, so if we save the chat until the, the question time and Sarah's going to host that, so thank you. So for that, and, and most of all, uh, please enjoy this afternoon. I think it's a really exciting presentation from John. So I hope everyone does enjoy it. And we're really pleased that so many of you have joined us. So a very quick setting the scene from me. So the, the challenge that we have is obviously we face a climate and ecological emergency. Um, at national level, government has responded to that through a range of policies and strategies and funding through something called Nature for Climate has been announced. So 640 million pounds to restore about a million hectares of, of peatland. Probably 80% of that will be in Scotland and also to create 30,000 hectares a year of new woodland. And the community forests, and you can see a map of where the community forests are across England. Uh, the community forests aspire to help deliver those, that target on, on new planting by creating 6,000 hectares across the areas we work in uh, by 2025. So that's the challenge that we're we're aiming to to hit. Um, what we want to do is so whilst government is is very keen to lock up carbon with trees, they and and we are interested in lots of other things as well. So carbon might be the driver, but we want to make sure that we create well designed woodlands that also can be very positive for for biodiversity, that can help with climate change adaptation, so reducing flood risk. That provides the health and well-being benefits that we know can be provided by trees and woodlands and which you know, we've got excellent evidence for so what we're looking for is those multiple objectives multiple benefits being delivered from the creation of these these new woodlands and the biodiversity element is, is the one we're going to focus on today but i know john is going to touch on some of these other things as well and the other Thing that we need to bear in mind is we've got two contrasting times to consider so uh, the graph you see on the top left hand corner of this slide is a piece of work that's been carried out for cheshire west local authority but it, it could be could be any authority across the country what it shows is a series of trajectories for the reduction in carbon that's required in a, in a particular local authority area over the next 30 years in order to to reach net zero uh, and in order to um, attain the, the be in line with the, the Paris Agreement on climate change. Um, and I'm not going to do all the details there, but basically it says for, for Cheshire West, and it will be the same for others, if we carry on spending our carbon at the level we are now, we've got six years of our carbon budget left. So we need to act quickly and we need to act decisively. But for those of you who are foresters or have been involved in, in forestry, obviously we think in, in hundreds of years. So as well as thinking about the present, we need to think about what we're creating for not just our children, but our children's children and beyond as well. So the challenge there and the challenge we've given John is, you know, how do we tackle the immediate, but also think about the, me the short, medium and very, very long term. 
So what we're looking to do is to get that balance between creating a good starting place for nature, mitigating climate change, adapting to changes that are happening as well. So reducing flood risk, tackling urban heat island. So no, no better person to take us through how we can best design our woodlands um, to, to maximise the opportunities for, for wildlife, biodiversity than John, John Rodwell. I'm really delighted that, that John's with us today and he's going to talk to us. We've worked with John now for probably 10 or 12 years and he's always been um, a source of uh, lots of information, being very kind with his, his guidance and advice um, and his, his wisdom. So delighted that he's, he said he would come back and talk to us today. Um, many of you will, will know John very well. He was the coordinator of the, the NVC, which quickly became the standard for assessing vegetation resources in conservation. He was Professor of Ecology at Lancaster and ran an NVC training programme and, and oversaw the development of various toolkits related to, to NVC. He's now an independent consultant um, providing expert advice and research for environmental agencies and ourselves today, thankfully. Um, I think the, the, uh, what I also wanted to, to show, this is a citation from John's award of the IE medal. Um, so I think this, this sums it up, John, a little bit. So John, I think more than any other ecologist of recent generations, has opened our eyes to the rich diversity of vegetation that occurs in Britain as our foremost phytosociologist. So John, we're really delighted that you joined us today and I'm going to hand over to John. Well, thank you, Paul. And can you hear me OK? Yeah. Fine. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Paul and, uh, and Sarah and uh, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you today. Um, it, it's my job to tell you uh, how uh, a scheme which uh, began uh, probably before most of you were born uh, could possibly be of relevance to your professional standards and the well-being of the woodlands which you're hoping to look after. So, yes. Uh, the NVC is the book which, beside the Bible and Shakespeare, you will be wanting to take to your desert island. So, next, please. And I, you'll notice I'm calling for Paul to change this because technically it's much easier to screen share from his end. So, excuse me if I keep saying that. So, why the NVC? Well, the benefits for you are, first of all, that it's the UK reference standard now for describing native woodland biodiversity. And that's not just ancient semi-natural woodland. Uh, we included uh, plantations, including recent plantations, though uh, coniferous plantations are excluded. So this is mainly broadly from mixed woodland, uh, often of recent age. And this has become uh, widely used, as Paul said, by uh, all of the major players in the UK. And still, despite its older starting date, it's still in widespread use today and recognised to be of value. Uh, in particular for you, it will help you meet the UK Forest Standard Guidelines on Biodiversity and also the Operational Note 43, uh, the guidance on uh, how to plant within or how to avoid planting on priority open habitats. And the third thing is that because uh, the NVC is now so widely used, uh, it means you've got a common language. And I noticed when you were checking in, uh, looking at the chat, that you're from a wide variety of um, uh, organizations or, already, uh, so you'll know that uh, you can talk to one another. Uh, uh, but this will give you another kind of common language uh, for working with project partners and to give some sort of validity and um, obvious quality over and above what you've got already uh, to the things that you're doing. Next, please. So what I want to do is, first of all, tell you a little bit about what the NVC is. And forgive me if you already know quite a bit. I'll assume that you know uh, fairly little, uh, just to sketch its main uh, outline. Uh, then I want to deal with how it can, in particular, help design and manage uh, new woodlands. I look at the biodiversity benefits, but also other uh, benefits which can come from using the NVC, uh, indirect ones, which uh, may be a surprise to you or maybe you know already. They'll certainly be within those categories that you're familiar with, which are already challenges like well-being, engagement with the community, uh, flood amelioration and so on. And then finally, I want to issue some warnings and to look at some problems and tensions uh, in uh, not only using the NVC for this particular task, but uh, the ways in which uh, focus on biodiversity might conflict with other uh, demands and other hopes for the plantings that you're undertaking. Next, please. So what is the NVC? Well, uh, it's a classification. Uh, it gives you a set of types of woodland, and it's based on uh, 33,000 samples of woodland vegetation uh, from across England, Wales and Scotland. Northern Ireland was excluded originally 
from the NVC, though a lot of work has been done uh, since uh, the NVC was completed there, which is compatible with it. But essentially, it's a classification of, of woodlands uh, on the mainland of the UK, and it's based on these samples, the distribution of which you can see uh, here on the map. Uh, the size of the blob, uh, it's uh, um, 10 by 10 kilometer squares, uh, indicates the number of samples per square. So you can see the spread of sampling is quite extensive. We had only three and a bit sampling seasons and only five people to do this work. We used quite a bit of existing high quality data when it was available and completely compatible. Uh, but most of the work uh, for these 33,000 samples was done by the team. So the coverage is uh, not bad. Uh, the density is obviously greater in some places than others. We didn't focus on rare woodland types, on semi-natural woodland types. The aim was to cover everything that was there. Uh, the survey included peri-urban and urban areas. It ran from the upper uh, reaches of high tide mark to the top of mountains. Uh, it included open waters um, and uh, made habitats associated with human industrial and uh, settlement activity. So uh, pretty comprehensive uh, overall. Next. And what we did at each of these 33,000 samples was make a complete record of the species composition on that spot. The sample sizes varied. They were small for grassland, for example. In a woodland, we'd have taken a 50 by 50 meter canopy sample and the field layer in a smaller sample inside that. And in each, each of these samples, we recorded a complete list of all the flowering plants, uh, grasses, sedges, and rushes, uh, all the mosses and liverworts, and all the bigger lichens. So it, it's a pretty authoritative and comprehensive survey in that respect. The, the team of surveyors were skilled, the data is of high quality, uh, and it's the same kind of data, the same quality of data in all the samples that we've got. We had minimum data standards. As well as recording the plants that we found, uh, we recorded basic environmental features, altitude, slope, aspect, the underlying geology, solid geology and superficial geology, um, glacial deposits and so on, blown sand, and uh, the, the, the characteristic of the soil with a soil pH, if possible. And then in that big box, you can see here, it's a woodland sample actually, I'll come back to this particular one in a minute. Uh, you can see uh, some text which describes in words what the vegetation looks like, a little lollipop diagram to help understand. Uh, everything is geo-referenced uh, using the national grid, not uh, latitude, longitude, uh, named and numbered. So as a basic sample type. And it was all done uh, by pen and paper. You'll be surprised to hear. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Next. And this enabled us, uh, these data enabled us to define uh, almost 300 different kinds of plant community. And these are uh, described, published in these five volumes uh, of British plant communities, which were edited by me, but it was very much an editing job of the whole team of surveyors and uh, supervisors. Uh, you can still buy these books. Uh, they, you can get them as a paperback. You can get a reduction if you belong to uh, various societies. Uh, but they're widely available in libraries and maybe on your own organization shelves now. Sadly, or, although quite a lot of the information is uh, available online, there is no uh, digitized version of British bank communities. This is uh, one of the main expenditures of adrenaline in my body uh, that there's never been this. And we made a very good case uh, at the close of the project for creating a national database and creating a fully operational um, uh, online version of the NBC uh, with interrogation systems, drop down boxes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, no notice was taken of this until uh, a sort of retrospective catch up. And now text and maps have been put online. But it, it's a great missed opportunity in my uh, view, uh, like not undertaking care and management of a woodland. Next, please. So if we just look at woodlands and scrub and subscrub for a minute, um, and, and we are dealing here with uh, woodland and uh, types of scrub and subscrub, we've got communities of all those, I'll come back to that in a minute. The, the woodland data, or woodland and scrub data, uh, came from 2,800 samples uh, across uh, England, Wales and Scotland. Next, please. And just to go back to that sample I showed you, uh, you can see here now, uh, if we return to this, uh, that the um, species recorded uh, come from canopy, 
understory, field layer, that's the herbs, and the ground layer of mosses, liverworts, and lichens. So every woodland sample contains data from all these layers. So in a 50 by 50 plot for the big stuff above your head, and in smaller plot of five by five or 10 by 10 uh, for uh, the field layer. So this means, for example, that a particular tree species um, uh, can figure in not only one, but two or even three layers if it's present as a sapling or a seedling. And that kind of information gives you a valuable insight into the potential uh, successional processes that might be at play, the replacement of canopy trees by upcoming youngsters and so on. So that's a deliberate, uh, a deliberate uh, undertaking on our part uh, and we were able to use that information in the descriptions. Because we recorded uh, data from all these layers this makes the scheme somewhat different from the woodland classifications of um, Oliver Rackham and George Peterkin where the focus is on uh, canopy trees and shrubs and structure uh, because their interest of these two workers uh, was uh, primarily on ancient woodlands and how the inherited pattern of management uh, across uh, uh, England in particular um, had uh, left its mark on woodlands. I'm a great respecter of their work. Uh, Oliver Rackham has died now, sadly. Um, George Peterkin continues, but he's moved into farming and grasslands. Um, uh, but the, the two schemes, you have to think of them as complementary, the two approaches. Oliver Rackham was rather dismissive of the MDC. I think that in fact, uh, gave a rather wrong impression of it in some of his publications. But um, uh, the, two, the two approaches are really complementary. Woodland history is hugely important, and you will be, as Paul indicated, uh, making history uh, in what you leave behind. Uh, today's planting is tomorrow's history. Next. And what we identified from uh, these data were 19 kinds of woodland, four scrubs and two underscrub. Underscrub is uh, bramble. Uh, sort of stuff that you find difficult to get through because it comes up to your knees. Uh, scrubs are up to or above your head, uh, dominated by shrubs and uh, young trees, and the woodland types have a canopy. Uh, the coverage of the woodlands is, uh, I would say, very good. Uh, the coverage of the scrubs is not so good. There are several scrub types which don't figure in the NBC at all, and there's been some subsequent work uh, to uh, try and remedy that. Um, scrub is important as a habitat uh, for uh, passerines and uh, invertebrates. It's often very colourful. Um, it has value of its own. Uh, so it's important not to forget those. But the woodland types, uh, the cover is, is pretty complete. Next. Uh, if you want a quick um, and very accessible insight into what the MVC for woodlands is like, then uh, this is a very good download from the JNCC website. It's a, uh, a field guide to woodlands, which contains a, a better key than is in the, um, there are keys to the uh, vegetation types in the published books telling you what you're standing in. Uh, there's a better key, there are simpler descriptions and there are updated maps in this field guide, um, uh, which is edited by JNCC staff, particularly Keith Kirby, to whom I play great tribute, he's retired now, but Keith was a sort of inheritor of George Peterkin's mantle and has been uh, hugely important uh, in, um, uh, in applying the NVC and providing aftercare. He was an exception to the rule that uh, there was no um, care and maintenance. Next. And this is one of the results of Keith Kirby's coordination of subsequent work, uh, because you can see now the comparison between uh, this map and uh, the earlier one I showed you of woodlands. New samples of woodland uh, are shown here on uh, as hollow circles. Uh, if you've got a small screen like the iPad I'm working with, you perhaps can't see the difference, but you'll see it on the on the PDF. Um, Oh, if you've got a big screen now, you can see it. But there are a lot of new data here uh, collected by NBC, uh, uh, by um, uh, agency staff, um, uh, the conservation agencies, uh, by uh, other enthusiasts who met the minimum data standards in, in or NGOs and so on, uh, and amateurs. Uh, so we've got a very big uh, uh, woodland database now, which is accessible through JNCC. Next. And some of the methods to collect uh, these data have now been completely revolutionized. We did do this, as I said, in days before there was any possibility of uh, this kind of uh, field upload of data. This is a, a tough book um, NVC survey system, uh, which was used by the Scottish Woodland Survey. It uh, has a GIS uh, platform of where you're working. It has a GPS facility to show you where you are. And it has a pull down list of plant species. 
uh, and uh, indications of uh, proportions of the plant species on a little scale. So you can put your stylus, you can uh, note where you are, you can pull down the species list, you can tick, show how much of each there is, tick again, so and so on. Uh, you can store up a, a month's work or more of data and download it overnight in the back of your van. And you've got a whole uh, uh, woodland survey in a way which took us a great deal more time. Of course, the skills involved in identifying the species are still the same. And one important uh, virtue of the NBC and one inheritance of it has been that it, it really, I would say, uh, among certain sectors, revolutionized the quality of uh, data collection. Uh, because where people had species, uh, where previously people had said, oh, sedge species or even oak species, now there was a, um, a push to uh, be more accurate and to leave an inheritance of, of really high quality data that could be trusted. That was part of the training program. And at Lancaster, we ran 125 training courses and I, I trained about 3000 people uh, 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 with colleagues um, over uh, a period of uh, about 18 years. So that lodged a, a degree of skills among practitioners, which was hugely important. Next. And so there's been some update at the end. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, uh, can we go back one? Sorry, NVC update it is. Uh, so the NVC classification has been updated uh, because the survey has suggested uh, that there are some further woodland types, but not many, uh, really. It, there are fine, it's fine tuning, really, within the main frame. But the scrub types are more numerous than we gave the impression of in the first place. Uh, but you can still regard the NBC as published uh, in the uh, volume one and in that uh, Deborah Hall and Keith Kirby's uh, summary for JNCC. You can still regard that as authoritative. You don't need to worry that you're missing types, oh, unless, of course, you find types which nobody's yet seen, which is possible. Next. And this is the sort of rundown of the main types of woodland in the MEC, all the, all the types of woodland, but put into broad categories. So we've got six oak, birch and mixed broadleaf woodlands, three beech woodlands and a yew woodland, one pine and one juniper woodland, and then six woodlands dominated variously by alder, willows, sallows and uh, birch, and then the various scrubs and underscrubs. Next. But as, and this is the uh, co correspondence between, excuse me, correspondence between the NVC types, the broad groups, and the BAP categories. And the fit is sometimes a little bit loose, sometimes rather precise, uh, but you can easily see a, a sort of crosswalk uh, between these online, uh, if you just ask for coincidence between NVC and BAP. Uh, the oak birch woodlands correspond with the uh, oak and mixed broadleaf deciduous woodland, upland oak, Northern birch, upland mixed ashwood. Uh, that can be a little bit loose, that fit, but you can easily uh, chase that up. And then the beech woodlands, pine woodlands, and wet, old, wet woodlands, uh, they, they correspond pretty precisely. So if you're used to using the broader back categories, there's no problem in trying to get some finer detail um, as far as NVC is concerned. Uh, the BAP categories have become very widely used, of course, um, and that's great uh, because it enables people who don't want to go deeper uh, to talk about these woodlands, uh, but um, it would be, uh, if you want to know the detail, then you, you can go deeper. Next. If you're in the community forest, and here's the map you'll know only too well, you've got fewer to cope with because most of the community woodlands are in the lowlands, uh, so you can forget certain of the woodlands, uh, and uh, here are the types which you will be left with. For most of you, we're dealing with three oak birch and mixed broadleaf woodlands, except in the white rose forest, there'll be some upland mixed ash wood. I noticed some of you are also from Cumbria, for example, uh, where there isn't a community forest at the moment, but uh, so maybe this three stroke four is a, a bit uh, too tight uh, for you there, but we can come on to that in some questions if you wish. Uh, the three beech woodlands and yew wood, that's okay, and then uh, the, wet, the wet woodlands with alder, willow and birch. Uh, so it's a smaller repertoire, it's a smaller challenge if you want to get to know them in NVC terms, um, uh, but as we'll see, uh, there's still a lot of biodiversity to be had uh, within e even just a single type or many of the single types uh, for you to uh, aim for uh, and to celebrate. Next. For every one of the woodland types, and here's a picture of one of the nice ones. Uh, well, they're all nice, of course, really, but this is uh, one of the ones I like especially. Uh, this is ash maple, uh, field maple, that is dog's mercury woodland. 
it's a type dominated in spring by um, uh, wild garlic. Um, uh, so for each of the woodland types, what you've got in the NVC is uh, an indication, a list, a table of data actually, and some text telling you what the typical trees, shrubs, herbs, bryophytes, icons are of each of these types. Uh, and uh, the text will fill out uh, the variation in the proportions of these species that can be found in each of the types, because you've got some things which are constant, you've got some things which are um, uh, not so frequently found, but rather distinctive of the type, and then you've got a, a whole load of things which uh, come and go in the particular examples you've got, creating a whole repertoire of combinations of trees, uh, shrubs and herbs, uh, even just in trees, uh, in each of the woodland types. So there's quite a lot of variety within each type. So the NVC will tell you about this variety. Then the text will uh, uh, tell you also about the variety in structure of the woodlands, which is often a very important uh, feature uh, for the woodland itself, but also associated biodiversity and for its um, it, it's dynamic. Um, uh, and there's quite a lot of information there uh, from previous work. The NVC has got quite a big, big bibliography of previous uh, um, ecological studies and uh, surveys, uh, of course, at the time it was written. There's more now. Then for each woodland type, there's an indication of what the typical climate and soil uh, conditions are for each of the woodlands. Uh, each of the vegetation types, this is true of all of them actually, uh, is determined, its character, its distribution, its sustainability is determined by the environmental conditions. So the climate is described in general terms like lowland, upland, uh, uh, oceanic or continental, but also with some rather precise indications of temperature and rainfall conditions. Uh, and then terrain and soil is the other feature. Uh, what kind of underlying rock or um, superficials are there? Uh, what is the soil like? What's its fertility? Uh, what's the uh, water dynamic? Uh, what's the acidity or alkalinity? All of those things will be important for a particular type. So this, for example, the ash maple dogs mercury woodland uh, is characteristic of uh, particular climate, soil and terrain. And then there's indication of biotic features. We didn't do any quantitative measurements of this, but we do try and provide in the descriptions as much information as we can about the way in which the woodland has been created and managed, as is evident from the structure. This is just reading off. We didn't go into historical information. Uh, but what the, uh, what the structure tells you about the management, uh, for example, is it coppice? Has it been pollarded? Uh, is it of uh, uniform age? Can it be of uniform age? Is it usually planted? Is it uh, a naturally um, uh, originating woodland on a particular kind of rough terrain and so on? And uh, also uh, some indication of other biotic um, uh, effects, for example, related to browsing or grazing animals like uh, deer or, um, or stock, which can be hugely important, as you'll know, uh, for regeneration and determining the structure and uh, the composition. Next. And for every woodland, uh, there's a distribution map of the samples we had, or the samples which have now become available. And this is a map of this uh, uh, ash maple uh, Dogs Mercury Woodland, uh, including those subsequent data collected under the supervision of Keith Kirby. And you'll see it's rather strikingly confined to the lowlands, and that means areas, generally speaking, with less than a thousand millimeters of rain, uh, less uh, than uh, uh, more than 26 degrees Celsius mean summer maximum temperature. And that's before climate change. Um, uh, so a, a warm, dry climate, and it's characteristic of uh, terrain which is uh, base rich. So you can see effectively this is a map of um, uh, calcareous bedrocks and superficials, chalk, Jurassic limestone, magnesium limestone, carboniferous limestone, soils which are carrying uh, renzinas uh, or uh, base rich uh, brown earths, calcareous brown earths, and those are the kind of constraints of this uh, particular system which determine its distribution. And, and the data are uh, are a pretty good fit for each of the woodland types you've got. So you'll get a clear picture from the NVC of the determinant factors of each of these uh, woodlands. Next. So how can the NVC, uh, the, these sorts of data, this kind of information, this kind of uh, common language, help you design and manage new woodlands? Next. Well, what we have to do is to turn the NVC on its head. Aha, next. And if you do that, uh, what you end up with is this. 
uh, uh, this little uh, booklet, which I co-authored with Gordon Patterson, who at that time was the chief uh, ecologist of the Forestry Commission, uh, called rather grandly Creating New Native Woodlands. And it's a Forestry Commission bulletin. Uh, it doesn't have the authority of uh, guidelines, so it's never been tied to a grant scheme. Unfortunately, I think, actually, but it's become very widely used by conservation agencies, local authorities, um, enthusiasts uh, who wish to use the NVC as a predictive tool. Next. Because what the NVC will do if you turn it on its head, it will indicate those trees and shrubs which are suitable for different types of climate, terrain and soils where there is at present no woodland, but where you could sustain a woodland type recognizable within the NVC. Next. So for example, if you are in the warmer and drier lowlands, as most of you are, if you're standing on uh, or want to plant on uh, shales, clays and heavier superficial deposits, both the clay and so on, which have brown earths or glade soils, uh, glades are soils which are kept periodically wet or waterlogged by surface water or groundwater, uh, and they're usually soils which are moderately fertile, uh, and uh, of moderate pH, that is uh, neither extremely calcareous nor extremely acid. If you're in such a situation, and this is what the guidelines tell you on the page for this particular woodland, next. This is what you could sustain on that um, terrain. And this is another uh, lovely looking uh, woodland, uh, mixed broadleaf bluebell woodland. All the NVC types incidentally have this little, uh, this little code and number like W10. That means it's woodland number 10. Um, and these are quite handy. For example, if you're mapping, uh, they're very handy because they provide a little sort of shorthand. Uh, but nerdyish uh, barroom boars uh, just talk in terms of W10 or MG3, or as I was once asked on a training course, could you really explain the difference between H8B and M23A? And well, it's better to use the names. And all the names have a sort of vernacular uh, name. In the published books, they all have the technical name, uh, like uh, Quercus betula, vaccinium woodland, and so on. Or in this particular case, uh, uh, Quercus, um, I can't remember what it is actually. Anyway, it vernacular, it's mixed broadleaf bluebell woodland. Uh, a delight, of course, and rather characteristic of the Atlantic parts of Europe. Uh, this sort of woodland doesn't occur uh, south or east of uh, northern France. Belgium, the Netherlands. Uh, and so it's one of the glories uh, uh, that we have in this country and very widespread and common, of course. Next. And what the guidelines will tell you uh, is uh, what trees and shrubs to plant if you're interested in sustaining this sort of woodland on the suitable terrain. And you'll see here the trees are listed and they're broken down into major and minor trees and shrubs because the Guidelines, uh, uh, the um, bulletin assumes that you will want to plant shrubs as well as trees. Very important, I would say. And they're divided into major and minor. And that means if you've got 10 areas which you're planting, 10 separate areas, uh, then the major ones, major trees and shrubs, are those which should figure in a majority of those areas, but not necessarily all. The minor, and if you've got one area, then these are the trees and shrubs which should dominate over that area. The minor trees and shrubs are those which would figure in a smaller proportion of a number of plantings, say uh, four out of 10, uh, or in a minority of the cover in a particular single planting. So here, here's the list. Uh, so for this particular woodland type, you see we're dealing with pedunculate oak, uh, sessile oak towards the uh, locally in the south and east and to the north and west more commonly. And so the list gives you a bit of nuance as to where you are. It, this is prevailingly lowland, but it gives you a bit of guidance as to what you might favour if you're in a certain part of the lowlands. Then among the minor recommended trees, holly, rowan, crabapple and so on, um, those which might be local, aspen and gene, uh, and those which are sub-regional. So in parts of the lowlands, hornbeam in the south and east, ash and witch elm to the northwest. And I'll come back incidentally to what we do about those trees which now have uh, experience some threat or other. So witch elm is much less common than it was, and ash, very sadly, is becoming much less common than even we knew it a couple of years ago. So, and then there's the shrubs and, and uh, major and minor in the same way. So there's quite a variety, you see, within the guidelines as to what a particular woodland type 
uh, might look like in terms of the trees and shrubs you're putting into the ground. Um, so even though it's all a characteristic mixture of mixed broadleaf bluebell woodland, uh, you, you could have uh, 20 or so plantings of this kind of woodland, all of which were different one from another. So inside each type, there's a lot of um, uh, push and pull as to what particular biodiversity you might yourself be trying to encourage. Next. And then there's an indication of what vegetation already existing might really give you a leg up into getting what you want in the end. Uh, and so there's a, this is called the optimal precursor. So here you're looking at rank grassland with, for example, uh, false oak grass, Yorkshire fog, coxfoot and so on, and perhaps areas which already have some bramble, common gorse, broom. Now, um, this is an optimal precursor. And you might think, well, planting among such rough terrain in any case is going to be a bit of a challenge, but there's another thing. Next. Oh, here's a picture of this. Sorry, I'd forgotten we got this. Uh, so this is a picture of that sort of uh, terrain uh, may, where you might be uh, thinking that uh, uh, you can have a mixed broadleaf bluebell wouldn't. It's the right climate, it's the right terrain and soils, and here you've got an optimal precursor. Uh, this sort of vegetation is often associated with this woodland in semi-natural conditions. Next. But warning, because if you just think about it, uh, many of these optimal precursors may well be priority habitats, which are unwooded at the present time, but which have biodiversity value of their own. So we'll come back to this point, and I'm just highlighting as we go a number of things with this red uh, font, um, uh, to, so we can store them up and think about this. Uh, so uh, we, we need to remember uh, that that might be one tension. Next. Then you've also got a list of species which are almost certainly not present at the present time uh, under uh, unwooded conditions, but which are typical of the woodland you're aiming for. So a bluebell does occur in the open, of course, uh, actually it usually occurs where there was a woodland canopy, but uh, in wider uh, grasslands, it's usually only confined to sea cliffs. Uh, uh, wood anemone, honeysuckle, hairy woodrush. Some of these species are shade dependent so they're not going to be present in open vegetation so much. So these are the things that you want to watch out for uh, uh, to give you your full complement. Uh, you want to recruit them um, uh, from, uh, well, where? Next. Because the question is, okay, uh, you want to get these into the woodland, but where are they going to come from? So that's one thing to think about, which may determine where you want to locate your woodlands. Planting adjacent to a bluebell woodland will give you a much better prospect of uh, these species invading. Bluebell is quite a good invader, it produces massive amounts of seed. And you could, of course, seed some of these in if you want, or you could even put plugs in a developing woodland, uh, expensive in terms of cash and uh, uh, time commitment, uh, but maybe uh, in some cases you would want to do this. So desired invaders. So the first question is where are these going to come from? Second, next. Um, how long do we have to wait for them to get here? Uh, this is a picture of Lancaster University where I used to work and the uh, woodland planting shown here are various ages. The ones at the bottom were planted about 150 years ago uh, and when this was an open farm landscape purchased by a man from the southeast of England with an interest in shooting uh, and he planted these as shelter belts to give some uh, cover uh, for game and uh, they are a varying mixture of trees you didn't know about the MVC of course and he doesn't seem to have had a very good idea about what to plant so the species tree mixtures are rather peculiar uh, but the older woodlands have recruited uh, some of the characteristic herbaceous plants like bluebell uh, of the woodland type that you might expect uh, the plantings at the back are uh, coterminous with the founding of the university in the mid 60s and these are much poorer still so how long will you have to wait uh, even if you plant the right trees before the thing looks like a woodland um, planting uh, trees uh, in uh, 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 an area where there aren't any is a, a, a nice political hit uh, with local communities they think oh yes you'll know that uh, but planting trees is not a making a woodland as we know so we'll think a little bit about that uh, accumulation of uh, meaning and culture shortly. Next. Uh, and what happens if things come in that you don't want? Uh, what are you going to do about keeping them out? Uh, maybe there are some trees and shrubs which you don't want to be part of your planting, which appear naturally because they're roundabout and are able to uh, seed in, in in one way or another. Um, so uh, what, what about this? Um, next. 
And then the uh, bulletin provides you with design guidelines, and these are fairly generalised and, 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 and uh, 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 simple. Uh, but and you'll know already because of your um, accumulated experience that uh, well, the received wisdom is to plant in two or three species uh, mixtures uh, and to plant in this or that particular way. But these guidelines are a reminder that if you're using the NVC. You could aim for a whole range of varieties with major and minor components, but you could plant in different ways that are going to give you a woodland which has um, different densities of planting. It has open space uh, for recruitment of uh, new individuals from the planted trees or for others, uh, for there to be succession and maybe even for the retention of open habitats of interest in association uh, with the uh, woodlands that you're planting. Next. So uh, here's an early example of um, uh, planting uh, uh, according to uh, Bulletin 112 um, uh, uh, rules. Uh, this was uh, very early on after we produced the book and it was a very nice example, uh, we thought, because uh, two um, aging sisters who were a little bit like two women out of Mal and Bennett play, um, uh, said they would like to leave a couple of fields in memory of a family member. So we got together, uh, the Forestry Commission, uh, with this booklet, me and my team, uh, with the National Park Authority uh, near uh, in Cumbria and with the Wildlife Trust, and we planted, uh, we produced planting uh, uh, prescriptions for uh, what trees and shrubs should be present, how they should be planted, uh, and so on. And then it was handed over to, uh, to some uh, consultant company, and they completely ignored uh, these uh, suggestions. They planted uh, almost no shrubs. Uh, they didn't vary the composition according to uh, our uh, requests and guidelines. Uh, they just planted everything uh, re regimented in, uh, in rows. Um, and uh, the message here is you have to follow through and uh, well, maybe you have a grip on this. Uh, you don't walk away from the planting, you, uh, from the designs you've produced, but you actually do it yourself. But if you don't, it's worthwhile trying to use these opportunities for educating um, contractors into uh, uh, doing things in a different way. Um, it, it, uh, the trees took off. Um, uh, and uh, of course, in those days we were using plastic. So uh, that's another thing we need to follow through on. Next. So uh, what I'll do is break there. So we'll have 10 minutes now um, uh, for us to take whatever kind of break we want. And then we'll resume. And I think Sarah will tell us all when we're back in the room, I hope, uh, more or less. Uh, and uh, then I'll resume by, first of all, showing you some examples of how this uh, design and management uh, idea can uh, work at a couple of scales. Thanks. Uh, so what I want to do now is just look at two uh, uh, possible examples of uh, how this uh, approach might work. Uh, so here we have, a, a, well, you could say, a pretty representative slice of, uh, of West Yorkshire. This is a map showing the area between uh, Wakefield and South Leeds. There's the intersection between the M1 and the M62. And I just want to focus in on that area, which is uh, boxed there. Next. Um, so here we are, and this is in the area of North Wakefield called Abwood. And the reason for focusing on that uh, bit outlined in, in uh, Reddy Brown, you'll see in a minute. But this is, is a peri-urban landscape um, uh, with uh, housing on the fringes of, of Wakefield. Uh, Post-industrial, um, there's uh, the remnants of um, collieries. Uh, uh, from recent and less recent times, uh, and uh, 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 light industrial area. The, the area almost in the centre uh, at the top is Wakefield 41, the big uh, uh, sort of um, estate where um, uh, for storage of, uh, of goods and so on. And this is a landscape which is at the present relatively unwooded. Uh, the green here shows the areas which uh, are the treescape, uh, a few Victorian uh, shelter plantations, uh, some spread, natural spread along uh, former uh, rail tracks, and at the top, a big uh, bit of green, which is on um, colliery uh, waste uh, after the closure uh, of the, the main pit in this area. So next. So if we use uh, geological and soil data, we can uh, give a, a, 
a fairly simple indication of the envelopes available for planting here. Uh, so this shows in green uh, the shale um, landscape, um, the coal measure shales, uh, carrying uh, brown earths and glade soils, which could sustain that mixed broadleaf bluebell woodland, which we've been using as a general example. Uh, the uh, ready brown russety colored um, uh, red uh, areas are uh, grit sandstone. Uh, and then you've got a little bit of wetland along some streams at the bottom. But we'll, let's just focus on the on the green for a moment. So this is the area within which uh, that mixture of trees and shrubs, characteristic of uh, the mixed broadleaf bluebell woodland of the lowlands, could be planted with some assurance of uh, ultimate su success in their taking and eventually uh, the long term uh, creation of a woodland which resembles uh, the mixed broadleaf woodland uh, bluebell type. Next. And within this area, you could target particular kinds of land which might, for one reason or another, be uh, susceptible uh, and welcoming uh, of uh, tree planting initiatives. So here I've just uh, highlighted the education land, school grounds and other education property, uh, which might provide some opportunity for planting within the shale brown earth envelope, the mixed broadly bluebell envelope, uh, for planting the appropriate uh, trees and shrubs of that particular type. But you've also got um, uh, opportunities on uh, around a trading estate uh, on the farmland. Uh, here it's mostly uh, grass, uh, often used for horse uh, rearing, actually, um, recreational horse rearing. Um, uh, and uh, the derelict, underused, and neglected land inherited from uh, coal mining. Next. So that's that's at a local scale. I'll come back to that example for other reasons in a minute. Let's just look on a slightly larger scale where there was a, we had a more sophisticated approach to um, um, targeting um, uh, possible uh, woodland. This is um, uh, the Dern Valley in South Yorkshire. So uh, it's in between, the bottom right is Doncaster, top left is uh, uh, Barnsley. Um, and it's a landscape which is uh, coloured here according to master map. This is a slice out of master map. Um, uh, which has the um, polygons uh, coloured according to their land use categories. So as you can see, there's a good deal of um, uh, agricultural land here, um, uh, but it's also an urban landscape uh, and a, a lot of post-industrial land, which is now being converted uh, largely to uh, retail uh, parks, trading estates and so on, uh, light industry. Uh, and with some areas of woodland, um, you can see uh, coloured uh, dark green, uh, some areas of which are actually of very considerable antiquity and interest, uh, others uh, more recent, but ample opportunity within this landscape for, uh, plant, for new plantings for particular reasons, biodiversity and others. Next. So if we want to now do what we did with the outward, and that is map the terrain uh, and the soils, here we see the same combination of, of, uh, of colours and uh, terrain types, actually, as we have in the outward. It's essentially the same geology, um, not far removed, actually, a few 10 kilometres or so from the outward area. Uh, uh, it looks a bit complicated, but it, effectively it's an alternation of uh, shales and brown earths uh, with uh, grit sandstones uh, in brown. Uh, with um, uh, acid brown earths and um, uh, podsolized soils, and then quite an extensive area, dark blue, of alluvium along the Dern and Dove valleys. The little area of pale blue to the right uh, is magnesium limestone. You can just leave that. It's a very interesting and nice landscape, but we'll just leave it out of the uh, story for a minute. Uh, and it looks complicated, but effective. It's like a piece of corrugated cardboard uh, that you've got up, up, right, up rising uh, ridges and then low uh, shales, uprising ridges, low shales, alternating on and on and on, aligned roughly uh, northwest to southeast. So that's ba the basic terrain. So we have, we have four landscape types, counting the um, Permian limestone, uh, and four potential woodland types, which we could uh, uh, plant in these different kinds of landscape. Next. But here's a rather sophisticated approach to uh, targeting, or we might call opportunity mapping. Uh, now we've got the uh, the terrain types, uh, same combination of colours, but they're a bit they're a bit uh, different. Uh, but you can see green and brown, uh, the blue alluvium, and the Permian limestone has become red at the far right. Just leave that out again. And what we've done here is we've used the master map polygons and we've coded them according to how functional they are in ecological terms. In other words, how congenial are these polygons 
for planting trees in the first place. Uh, so it's a one to five scale. It was a map based exercise and it's very crude. So that, for example, concrete, roads, schoolyards, church surrounds and so on, uh, buildings, building areas, these are coded one, dysfunctional for planting. Five is semi-natural grassland. Um, in between, we've got farmland, orchards, and so on and so on. So it's, it's a very crude way of trying to um, uh, find opportunities within these broader envelopes where it might be sensible to target uh, tree planting. Uh, this was work which was done uh, technically by Chris Ling uh, uh, under the supervision of me and uh, John Handley, who was Professor of Landscape and Planning uh, in Manchester. Um, a very nice piece of GIS work beyond my capacity, but Chris was a wizard at this. And it's a, it's a very nice approach and it, it's attracting new interest in the calculation of um, natural capital, actually. Uh, next. And there are particular opportunities within these highly functional areas uh, for planting on derelict, underused and neglected land. So here, here we're back to the colours have gone back to uh, a more congenial mixture now, uh, but it's the same idea. Uh, shales and grits alternating with the alluvium in the bottom. And here in this little snatch that I've enlarged, you can see on more highly functional bits of shale terrain, opportunities which might be possible for planting these trees on land, which uh, the use of which is now uh, open uh, to uh, other possibilities than was the case before. Uh, this is re-landscaped colliery uh, land uh, and its associated grounds. The size of the white blob indicates how much of it there is. So there we've got uh, some kind of, uh, we've got the uh, discerning the uh, envelopes, the geological and soil envelopes on which planting may take place. Some attempt to find uh, more functional bits of those terrains where planting may be more successful, and then uh, what you might call the economic political uh, project opportunities related to particular uh, places, in this case, um, on Donnell. So those are, those are two possible uh, ways in which this application might work. Next. So let's just sum up what biodiversity benefits the NVC could bring. Next. What it enables you to do is to select and plant appropriate sustainable mixtures of trees and shrubs in particular types of terrain. So you've already got some biodiversity bonus by knowing what species are going to survive, um, what are going to be characteristic of the woodlands appropriate for that terrain. Second, you've got ample opportunity for variety in the tree species and shrubs that you use in these plantings for the proportions and how you plant them in particular places. So as I said before, if you have 20 possibilities to plant mixed broadleaf bluebell woodland, every one of them could have a different uh, a species mixture in terms of the planted trees and shrubs uh, to some degree. Third, You've got the possibility of having diversity not only in composition but of structure ultimately uh, so how you uh, care in your care and maintenance uh, how you manage these things how you uh, monitor the uh, natural regeneration that's occurring among them uh, then you can uh, diversify uh, the composition structure and, and put another layer of diversity on top of this and that affects not only i mean uh, of course i'm a plant ecologist so I'm primarily skilled in and interested in plant species, but all of these things have knock-on benefits for other biodiversity. I've mentioned in passing small passerines, invertebrates and so on, but there's a whole range of associated biodiversity uh, which could respond to these uh, different kinds of, let's say, mixed broadleaf bluebell woodland uh, in their different ways. And last, you've got the best context here for recruitment of species associated with these woodlands in more semi-natural conditions. So uh, you've got a, a, a leg up from choosing the right types of terrain, you can target, you can use particular opportunities, but this then provides you with an inheritance, which in future years you hope uh, will recruit uh, species appropriate to the site. Next. However, let's look a bit more widely because the NVC doesn't only describe woodlands, it describes all sorts of other associated um, uh, grasslands, heaths, uh, and so on, uh, tall herb communities, uh, which might be associated with the same terrain you're working on, uh, but which are not themselves woodlands. So these are other predictable kinds of vegetation which are sustainable in the same uh, habitat conditions. So you could use this kind of knowledge uh, to provide mosaics and ecotones, mosaics among your plantings, ecotones between the woodlands and the rest of the, the, rest of the landscape, and provide some connectivity 
uh, from one planting to another. And this would give you a, a, a further tier of diversity in species composition, but in also in the habitat structure and the whole character of the landscape. Um, so let's look at an example. If we just go back uh, to the Dern Valley, next. So here's that, that map of the Dern Valley again with the geology, the, the envelopes of uh, possible planting shown and highlighted here in the other box is another bit of the landscape which uh, just brings to the fore uh, the floodplain, which is uh, uh, rather extensive actually in the Dern Valley, unusually for such a small, relatively small river, the Dern and its tributary of the Dove, uh, but the, the floodplain is quite wide here. Uh, and this is a floodplain with alluvial soils, uh, naturally very rich. Um, and uh, next. Uh, but at the present time, uh, this has regulated drainage uh, to try and prevent uh, uh, flooding. Uh, you could, the Dern and Dove run along the left hand side, of, uh, the right hand side of this uh, image that you can see. Uh, the area of open water is an inherited um, uh, 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 flash that developed in a subsidence area uh, within a field. Uh, but this is uh, highly intensive agricultural land uh, regulated from flooding by the uh, bank and the uh, straightened stream in some places, uh, which is devoted now to um, uh, grassland for silage uh, and arable cultivation uh, and almost no woodland in the floodplain. You can see little bits at the bottom here, but there's, there's not much woodland in this floodplain at all. Next. But what there could be is this, and this is called in NVC terms alder nettle woodland, which sounds a bit boring, uh, but nettle is naturally present in this woodland because it's a nutrient demanding uh, plant. It's not a problem. Uh, it decays very quickly and creates more nutrients. And it's associated under this canopy of alder and crack willow, Salix fragilis usually, uh, sometimes only crack willow actually, um, and some sallows underneath and climbers, sprawlers, um, it's associated the nettle with uh, more light demanding herbs in open spaces like meadowsweet, for example, iris, um, uh, eupatorium, uh, hemp agrimony, and so on. And sometimes in open wetter places, things like reed uh, and float grass. So it's, it's quite species rich. And this is the sort of woodland which would be sustainable uh, on this uh, alluvium. Next. But we could also have a whole range of associated vegetation types, which the NVC could help you predict and understand on this kind of terrain. So here we've got a, a little image, a drawn image in the foreground to the bottom right. Uh, on this side, we've got the regulated floodplain, uh, which is highly intensive and dominated by it's that little code, MG7. It's a ryegrass uh, lay. So uh, hugely productive, but immensely demanding uh, for uh, nutrients uh, and uh, completely unvarying. On the other side is an attempt to show what you could have with a deregulated floodplain where there was uh, winter wet. So the water's held on the ground. It drains off in the summer. Uh, and uh, if you don't plant trees and you manage the uh, ground in a variety of ways, you could have a range of associated woodland types, which here are shown as a nice ecoterm, but you could have these just one or the other in association uh, with woodland. Next. And here are some little pictures to show you what these look like. So we could have tall herb uh, vegetation, um, which uh, just is managed by periodic mowing every few years and uprooting invading trees and shrubs. You could have a floodplain meadow uh, technically meadows are mown, that's the meaning of the word meadow. So this is land which is winter flooded, uh, but uh, hugely productive, uh, even without the addition of nutrients if you've got alluvium deposited, um, and which could uh, sustain a meadow, which uh, ultimately might be really quite interesting uh, in its composition. Uh, it needs to be mown, it needs the stuff removing, and it needs you to have a market or somewhere to put the hay when you've taken it off. Or you could have a floodplain pasture, uh, that is not mown, uh, but winter wet and grazed, uh, dry enough for grazing with selected stock uh, in the summer. Uh, so there you've got a, a whole portfolio of possible types in the same kind of terrain. That is winter flooded, dry in the summer with various kinds of intervention. And you could think of this as, you could make a uh, cost benefit matrix out of this. Uh, what, what is the benefit, the biodiversity benefit of each of these types, uh, biodiversity and other benefits, and what is the cost of, for example, mowing uh, or having some grazing animals or providing people to take out invading trees and shrubs. So uh, there are costs uh, and you could weigh these against the benefits. So the NBC is quite flexible in providing you with some uh, framework for calculating natural capital as it's come to be 
uh, termed. But there's another great benefit of this kind of uh, mixture of uh, uh, vegetation types, and that is next, because you have the prospect of it helping you manage the floodwaters. So the water could be held higher up the catchment uh, than lower down. Here's a picture of Manvers Way um, uh, in about 10 years ago, uh, where you can see the uh, amphibious cars plowing their way through the waves majestically, sweeping towards one well. Um, and this is not really advantageous for um, uh, developing this sort of area. And the thoughtless uh, development of huge hard surface retail parks and roadways and mismanagement of the floodwaters throughout the catchment has uh, been responsible in the past for this sort of thing. But there's a much more enlightened view about this now. Uh, and uh, vegetation, um, uh, which you can understand using the NVC, can play a part uh, in, in preventing or, let's say, ameliorating uh, this kind of um, uh, happening. Next. But what about other benefits? We focused on biodiversity. Let's, so let's just look at that. Let's look at some of the other benefits that could come. Next, please. With this mixed broadleaf bluebell woodland. So let, let's go back to Outwood. And I'll come back to why there's this little leaflet uh, uh, here. But you can see in, on the leaflet is the map of the area, which I outlined uh, to you before, uh, as being characteristic of, of this part of, uh, of uh, Yorkshire. So what, what else might we do here? Uh, in this planting uh, uh, that would give us other benefits over and above. And how might these be helped by the NVC? Next. Well, if you're focusing on particular trees and shrubs, you could get information about these, ecological information, stories, um, uh, artwork in the curriculum connected with these particular trees and shrubs that you want to plant. And you could engage the school parents, the whole community, in planting trees and shrubs which they had learnt about, the kids in the classroom, uh, and in their own school grounds or roundabout. Uh, so you've got some sort of integration. You know, this is a common knowledge to you. you. It's what you do a lot of the time. But there is a particular way of using the NVC because you're focusing on particular trees which have a story uh, of one sort or another. Uh, they have an ecological uh, story. Uh, they have a cultural story. So giving that sort of richness uh, from the NVC, uh, knowing what trees you're focusing on, uh, could be a real benefit. Next. And in this landscape, there's a particular richness to that story because the area outlined on the map, and you can hardly see it here, but it's the area that I snipped out before, and it's outlined here in green, like a sort of flying raven moving towards the uh, right-hand side of that little leaflet. Uh, this is the ancient manorial forest of Wakefield. Uh, in uh, the years after the invasion of, uh, of um, uh, England by William of Normandy, he gave the manor of Wakefield to a crony. And uh, part of this gift was the great wood of Wakefield called the Outwood, it's because it's outside the city, the town. Um, and this was owned by the Lord of the Manor, but it was open for common use by the people of Wakefield. And the common use was governed by particular rules. And we know about these rules because every three weeks between the early 1300s and 1929, there was a court which met in Wakefield and considered um, rules and regulations for governing this land more recently, sort of planning rules. But in times past, the ways in which the commoners of uh, Outwood, Renthorpe, uh, use the woodland for this, that and the other. And some of the uses were legitimate. Some of the people were licensed to take wood uh, and um, uh, underwood from the uh, woodland uh, to um, have uh, hives of bees, for example, uh, to surface dig for coal, even in the 14th century, and clay uh, from the woodland. Uh, but also the um, court rows record infractions of these rules where uh, people um, uh, under cover of darkness had nipped into the woodland and uh, removed, uh, for example, here we see on the highlighted on the little snatch of, uh, this is the court row for uh, the 7th of April, 1349. Uh, and there we can see that uh, John uh, Nableton, who lived in uh, Renthorpe, was fined fortens. Uh, Richard Roller took many birches and hollies, and he was fined 12p. Uh, John Collinson, uh, for many maples cut in the great wood, he, he was fined, but his fine was respited. Immersement means fine. Respited means set aside. So John Collison took many maples illegally. Uh, he was fined, and then the fine was set aside. And the richness of these stories is extraordinary uh, for this particular period. I mean, you're thinking about 1349, a long time ago, but you get a very um, uh, clear picture of what was going on in this wood. Uh, this tells us what species were in the wood, birches, hollies, maples, I'll come back to that, um, uh, alders, 
hazel. This is just a little bit. So you could do your plantings in ways which were related to what you can tell from this particular um, uh, bit of information. And we devised a little uh, project for school children in which they would enact the stealing of maples. So somebody playing John Collins would steal into the uh, classroom and he would steal some maples. And then the children would enact a little court and they'd take great pleasure in fining him to them. So whatever it was for stealing the maples. And then they would set aside the fine. And then the same children would plant the trees which had been stolen in the story in their school grounds. So that's a kind of restoration a kind of healing uh, of their school grounds, planting particular trees named in the story to do with a particular bit of history. So that brings the history to life, another bit of the curriculum. Uh, it gets the kids excited about dressing up and playing a magistrate or naughty Mr. Collinson, um, and enables the ecology using the NBC to do something which is sustainable. Uh, and you get to, uh, the Collinsons were a really troublesome family, actually. Mrs. Collinson had a tendency for domestic violence and was brought before the court for attacking the woman who lived in the house next door. And I told this story in that sort of way to an audience of outward people. And afterwards, a man stood up at the back and said, my name's Collinson. I still live here. What do you say about our family? So there you see, uh, there's still some surviving uh, real history in this landscape connected with the stealing of some trees from such a long time ago. Next. Now, the terrain of this landscape is not sufficiently uh, lime rich to be able to, stay, to sustain much Acer campestry, field maple. Maple in the court rules, they were written in Latin in 1349, but other people have translated them than me. Uh, Acarus uh, means maple in common. Uh, vernacular. Um, uh, but there's not enough lime in the landscape here to sustain as much maple as is referred to in the outward court rolls. Uh, for example, 2,000 maples were taken from a woodland in this uh, area, uh, in the, according to the court rolls. Well, that's phenomenal um, uh, to think that that number of acecampestry could really be sustained, even in, let's say, uh, a plant, a deliberate planting. So maybe we're dealing with the other Acer, uh, Acer pseudoplatinus, here it is. Uh, in other words, sycamore. And if that's the case, this is the earliest documentary evidence, as far as I know still, uh, referring to sycamore. Uh, it's thought authoritatively to be a late medieval, early Tudor introduction. I don't personally think it's Celtic maple, which has survived since the post-glacial myself. But anyway, uh, according to the outward, uh, this is the first authoritative record. Uh, so that would be very interesting. Uh, Gordon Patterson was very much against including the sycamore in the uh, Bulletin 112. It's a tree I quite like, actually. Uh, next. And the reason there may be, have been so much acarus in this woodland, so much maple, is that there was a bowl making industry in uh, Renthorpe at the time. Uh, these are three nice sycamore um, uh, bowls which um, I um, bought in art shops around South Yorkshire. It's still used, uh, it's beautiful, and people use enormous quantities of wooden bowls because they didn't last very long for eating off, uh, so uh, the industry was quite thriving. So maybe uh, a new use of material taken from the woodland you're going to plant here, including sycamore, if you could bear that, uh, could be the regeneration of some artistic uh, endeavour, uh, uh, bringing that history to life in real uh, objects which people treasured. Next. But Paul indicated uh, that we're thinking here long term. So here is some nice sycamore of older age. Uh, when I wanted, and that's the picture on the right, uh, eight uh, meters of uh, sycamore, 40 millimeters thick, it took me a very long time to persuade my carpenter to use it, to persuade him to find a person who would uh, kiln it, uh, to have it long enough in the kiln under the right conditions that it didn't get fungal uh, black stuff that spreads through it just to find a woodland that could provide stuff of this size. Uh, but it's beautiful, it's wonderful, and it's traditional. So why not think in the longer term, if you wanted to plant sycamore and could bear that, of actually producing one of the most productive timbers that there could be on soils of the congenial type. People have got more used to welcoming sycamore, of course, with the demise of ash, which we could come back to, because it often thrives in the same conditions as ash. Next. But the other thing about this story is you can see there's Mr. Collinson complaining that I'm aligned his forebears of six centuries before. But we're talking here really about um, intergenerational equity that is passing on from the past to the future some sense of commitment to a place uh, which is expressed in a historical narrative and which could be made manifest in uh, a planting activity uh, with school kids in the local community. And that's about well being. Uh, uh, here's 
two generations. This is my dad, actually. He retired to Outwood. Uh, we're from uh, near Barnsley originally, but uh, for one reason or another, he retired to Outwood. So here are my grandchildren. So uh, there's quite a bit of intergenerational equity going on there. Um, sadly, my father's died, but the kids remember him. So they carried his story forward. And this is the pit lane on the right that led from Outwood towards the colliery, which has now disappeared, um, and where there's been planting uh, using uh, Bulletin 112. Next. So let's look at some warnings, problems, and tensions to finish. First, next. Remember, you'll know this anyway, but this is a warning from me. Many kinds of woodlands are species poor in their middle years. So the plantings become dense, they close up, and these occlude even the species which were there before you did the planting. So we have to think beyond that, and we have to think of how we tell that story to those people who come along and say, can't get in these woodlands, they're terrible. There's nothing in there, you know, not what they've done. Uh, and just think a little bit beyond that. This is the normal appearance of a mixed broadleaf bluebell woodland in its, uh, let's say, uh, 10, 25 year sort of phase. Next. Certain woodlands are rather species poor, even when they're mature. Uh, this is another woodland in South Yorkshire, at Wombwell, uh, which is a beech wavy hairgrass woodland, which because of the dense shade cast by beech and the ferocious removal of nutrients and water that its roots uh, uh, perform on the soils it is one of the most species poor woodlands uh, that there is if you leave the canopy closed so you have to be clear about what expectations you've got about ultimate biodiversity next i mentioned earlier that if you're going to have um uh, favored places for planting you need to be careful that these don't have um, a biodiversity value of their own so you need to target woodlands carefully because uh, woodlands are often in such situations often less species rich than the vegetation they replace so at least in their early years so the short-term benefits need to be very carefully um, uh, thought about in relation to where you're planting uh, because you could occlude a whole range of uh, interesting biodiversity which is already present and also of course where people have vested interests in the landscape remaining open so people get very attached to places with no trees just as they might like woodlands next Uh, make some decisions about which species are welcome. I've mentioned sycamore, which I'm a fan of, actually, as you can understand. Um, uh, but I, I do see how uh, it attracts um, uh, high feeling of one sort or another. Uh, here's another example of an incomer. This is a sweet chestnut um, uh, woodland in the southeast of England, uh, which has a lovely carpet of wood anemones in the spring because chestnut is a tree which thrives on um, uh, glade soils of uh, really poor drainage. And it's hugely productive, of course, and was very important in the past for um, uh, hop growing uh, because it provided the poles. Uh, on which the hot wires were uh, carried. It's probably a Roman introduction brought in the country to help sustain the troops by producing chestnuts, which is a bit of a lost cause at that time, I think, even when the climate was a bit warmer. Uh, but uh, you need to think about which species you want to welcome, which, which, which do you regard as intruders, which are long-standing uh, um, um, non-natives, which really are uh, honorary natives and so on. Next. The recruitment of biodiversity might be slow, so you have to think longer term. Now, if we could just go back to the outward, there's the little campaign, the little project leaflet, uh, and there uh, on the map uh, to the left is the area where the outward is. Now, the the blobs uh, are in. That's a map of West Yorkshire. The blobs show the uh, abundance of species characteristic of mixed broadleaf bluebell woodland across West Yorkshire. There are big gaps, of course, where it's urban, but you can see how scarce these species are in much of the wider landscape of South Yorkshire. So you have to be realistic uh, about short-term recruitment, how likely you are to get these plants if you uh, put your uh, new trees and shrubs remote from any existing bit of woodland uh, in the middle of a highly intensive agricultural landscape. Uh, and that sort of data, those sort of data are often available. This is from the West Yorkshire Plant Atlas. Next. Leave room among the plantings for natural processes. So I, I showed you how the NVC can help you predict what might occur alongside a particular type of woodland. This is Hawthorne dogwood scrub, a very nice uh, colourful uh, sort of scrub characteristic of the warmer and drier lowlands of Britain and a bramble underscrub in front. And that sort of ecotone can be hugely appealing uh, for associated biodiversity, not necessarily easy to manage because it's going to progress. So. You know, the, you, you may have scrub in this area, one generation of people, and you need to have scrub in another area and another generation 
and things are going to move on. So a longer term view of dynamics is really important in this sort of uh, world. Next. Just have a look around and see what's happening already um, in natural colonization. This is a pit heap on one of those areas of Dunwall, which I showed you, uh, in the Dern Valley. And this is oak birch wavy hairgrass woodland, which is developed naturally on coal spoil. So that the pioneer is, is Betula uh, varicosa, uh, Betula uh, pendula, the um, warty birch. Um, and uh, you can see an occasional oak, this one there, Squircus roba. Uh, the typical oak of this sort of situation in the south of England, uh, and wavy hair grass between. And this developed uh, naturally over 10 or 15 years uh, on this uh, coal spoil. Uh, when we talked with the South Yorkshire planners about what would happen to this, uh, they were very keen to remove this heap. Uh, the, the chief planning officer of Barnes determined it was a disincentive to inward investment. And any attempt to persuade him that it was a bit of cultural heritage about which he could tell a story and get tourism going fell on, well, ground as stony as some of this that you can see in the picture actually. And this area was landscaped. Actually, it's been replanted in a more imaginative way than for example, Corton Wood, uh, where huge heavy engineering was done to make a coal heap spoil, expensive layer of topsoil, planting of stuff in tuli tubes, alongside areas like this, where you've got it happening for nothing, no public expense, a natural story, leaving something behind helps prompt the memory. Next. Oh, sorry. Yes. So is this wilding or not? And what is rewilding? I noticed that in the environmental land management scheme, the latest material from DEFRA, it's now called wilding, not rewilding, which I prefer. But I think there's a lot of nonsense talked about wilding, frankly, because you're starting from often very uncongenial areas. You're letting things go. Of course, you're letting nature tell its own story. That's fine. It can be fine. Uh, but uh, wilding sells things. It's a good uh, political slogan and uh, it helps us um, uh, cue into um, uh, carbon um, uh, retention and so on. Uh, but we just need to think about uh, what is wilding. Uh, do we really end up with what we want if we let things rip uh, according to uh, what might happen in a particular area? Uh, in the Netherlands, the big rewilding areas now have human interventions because people don't like to see the natural graces dying naturally in a wild way. So it, it, it's often a cover for things which are uh, necessarily managed. Um, I'm not against letting colonization go, as you can see, but I think we need to think carefully about this term. Next. Now here's wilding in a very spectacular way. You might say this is a Zollverein in the Emscher Landschaftspark in Germany, uh, where a colliery has been left standing. Uh, all its uh, railway lines have been allowed to just simply become colonized. There's no gardening here. Uh, the site is visited uh, twice daily by uh, people who inspect it for safety, but you can walk anywhere here. You can see the, uh, the cultural inheritance that's uh, left behind in this landscape and that you've, yeah, you've got some sort of natural colonization taking place uh, to give you a, a mixture of, of culture and nature. This is called Industrienatur in German, industry nature, and we lack it uh, in Britain in almost every place that there's been uh, any kind of um, heavy industry. Next. Because what you're talking about here is trying to let the landscape story go on. You're not obliterating it, telling people to move on, as they were often done in the colliery um, uh, areas, uh, landscaping memory out of existence uh, by heavy machinery and creating something which, uh, well, may not be so sustainable anyway in the long run. Next. And that's about healing, I think, uh, in a bit, a bit like in Outwood, you could tell a rather amusing story about healing the past with Mr. Collins and his violent wife. Uh, but uh, healing the past is really important in terms of ensuring a future which is shared by people so that they feel they have some stake uh, in what's happening. Uh, it's their story. It's their landscape. Uh, it's their woodland, as well as the one you're planting yourself. Thank you. Thanks, John. That was, that was excellent. I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who's going to uh, coordinate the, the questions. So if you do have questions, you can start putting in, them into the, into the chat. Yep. So if everyone could just post their questions in the chat, I think it would be nice as well if people could post where they're from and their role, just to give John a little bit of background, you know, kind of what you're asking from. So yeah, if you post your kind of uh, your role and where you're from in the chat with your question, and we'll do our best to, um, to get through them all. Yep. 
John, I'm going to leave the slides up for now, just in case anybody wants to refer back to. Uh, one yeah, of okay, you, you can you can zip backwards and forwards. I've never seen myself, so I presume I'm there. <laughs> You're there for sure. <laughs> and um, we have got one okay. question actually that someone sent earlier that I can kick off with while everyone's kind of uh, thinking. Yep. So um, this was from Bob Thorpe. Um, I'm just going to read it out as it as it is. Could John say something about the practicalities of using NCV and the FC's ecological site classification decision support tool? And yeah. secondly, what are his thoughts on NVC and establishment by natural regeneration, or as its namesake now, rewilding, or as you said, wilding? And yeah. so I'll hand that one over to you. Okay, fine. Uh, well, yes, the ecological site classification was a, a rather sophisticated way of using uh, soil and terrain data to come to uh, the same kind of conclusions as I've been trying to outline to you today. So um, it's a more technical, um, uh, it has a more technical base, a, a more solid scientific base in terms of environmental data, but uh, the, it, it's essentially complementary. Uh, I find it, I've, I've it's, it's not because I was connected with the MVC, but I found it easier to use and explain the MVC than the ecological site classification. But it's a very useful uh, scientific tool, I think, for getting you to try and home in on the things which are likely to be sustainable. So, I mean, I don't know how many of you have seen it or, or, or use it, uh, but I would advise you to take a look at it. Uh, it was devised by somebody who has um, a great understanding of the MVC and, and uh, attempted to try and... Uh, work in a way which uh, made it evident that it was compatible uh, but but essentially the the aims are the same um i don't know whether that that answers the question sufficiently but uh, so and then the same person put this second part of the question about natural recolonization yes oh, i can't hear you sarah sorry uh, secondly what are your thoughts on mvc and establishment by natural regeneration yeah. or as its namesake now rewild yeah. Rewilding. Uh, well, uh, as I think, if you just go back, uh, uh, Paul, if you're in charge of the slides, if you just go back to the uh, the, the Grimethorpe Colliery, the Hanging Gardens of Grimethorpe. Uh, no, I think we've uh, uh, no uh, no. It, it, keep going. there. We are. So here are the Hanging Gardens of Grimethorpe, uh, which was um, a, a, actually uh, you know a, a very nice piece of natural regeneration uh, on rather uncongenial. Um, substrate actually because this is usually often highly saline this peculiar sort of stuff that comes out of the ground from great depth um, but it does show what can happen by natural colonization uh, i'm in favor of it of incorporating it uh, with planting uh, with, with i'm in favor of wilding if you want to give it that term but i think it needs uh, explaining uh, to uh, people uh, because um, uh, if you leave areas to naturally colonize uh, people often think uh, these are not being properly managed by the people to whom we pay our well, but council tax, let's say, these days. And one of the big problems about uh, Dunnell land is that planners uh, use terms. If you look at uh, surveys of Dunnell, for example, in places like the Down Valley, it will say uh, this land uh, is untidy, uh, it's unsafe. Um, there's a suggestion of health and safety from the point of view of, well, it might contain people lurking uh, amongst this developing scrub and we don't want our children playing in this sort of landscape. Um, uh, something's happening which we've not got control over. Uh, and that's a real problem, I think, for some planners. Uh, they like to know what's happening. And for an ecologist to look over a fence and say, My, ooh, something's happening. It's great, actually. It's very interesting. And there are benefits about natural colonization. Uh, which, uh, for example, uh, with associated biodiversity, through, so through the stages of natural colonization, you can get different contingents of uh, other biodiversity, birds and invertebrates and so on. Um, but it does need uh, preparation, uh, public preparation with uh, stakeholders as to what's going to be done. It does, I would say, need oversight so that you have to uh, in intervene if things happen which you don't actually want. So it's not really wild. Well, that doesn't matter really from my point of view. And you have to decide whether what you're going to get in the short term is something which let's say by the end of your working lifetime is what you really wanted to bequeath to the community. So I think that there's, there's tensions all the way along there, but in, in principle, um, I'm in favor. It, it would be, well, a great deal cheaper than spending a very large amount of money 
getting people to plant trees in places where they might well colonise on their own. For example, I, I, I used to, well, before lockdown, I drove very frequently along the M62. And along those uh, very dramatic uh, cuttings in the gritstone on top of the M62, uh, before you get to Huddersfield, all that was bare for very long, before it colonised quite naturally with birch and oak and bilberry. Um, no money was spent there. And there's a bit of the northern corridor for us at no public expense. So I think it, it's worth considering. Don't do yourself out of a job. Great, thank you. Um, so you have got a couple more questions coming through. So this is, I think, from Hugh. Um, hasn't said where he's from. Um, but he said, you suggested sycamore might be a suitable replacement for ash in some circumstances. Mm -hmm. And um, please, could you say a little bit more about how we can respond to the challenge of ash dieback and other tree diseases? Mm. Yes, uh, for me, I feel uh, ash dieback is almost an emotional thing, actually. I'm immensely attached to ash as a tree. I think it's such a beautiful tree and uh, such a peculiar tree that one that could come into leaf so quickly and lose its leaves so early could produce so much carbon in terms of its timber. It's a, a really very interesting tree and it's, it's hugely... Um, uh, sad that it's succumbing. Uh, and uh, I don't know how many of you have walked in the Lake District before lockdown, for example, but the very old inherited uh, pollarded ash, which are really um, uh, uh, related to uh, Scandinavian traditions of taking leaf hay, for example, these also now have uh, ash dieback in some places. And these are trees of, of probably two or 300 years old, some of them continually managed by the National Trust and others in this traditional way. So I think the loss of ash is immensely, is going to be immensely um, uh, evident in our hearts as well as in reality. So uh, what to do? Uh, well, um, I'm not boned up on how much uh, resistant ash is being bred, but I have heard that there's some possibility of uh, um, breeding strains which are resistant to, to uh, die back. But in the meantime, uh, we need to think about what might be done to replace ash, which will be a huge loss in places like the White Rose Forest, for example, the Yorkshire and Derby in Yorkshire Dales, and in other places out with the community forests like the Derbyshire Dales uh, on the Southern Lake District limestones. It, if, if ash goes there, this is going to leave a big gap. So if we want to continue some sort of um, canopy shading, we've got to consider replacements. Um, it, I think it depends on where you are, what you might think about planting. Uh, ash and sycamore overlap in their environmental requirements, but they're not the same. Uh, Sycamore is a, a moisture demanding tree, but the uh, drainage must be free. So it will only grow in areas where the rainfall is, it, it will only thrive naturally in areas where the rainfall is above 700 millimeters per year. Uh, that's striking across Europe actually. Um, and it will only thrive in places where the roots are in soils which are uh, moisture rich. Uh, but free draining, like in colluvium at the bottom of slopes, for example. So it does particularly well there. So if you're talking about uh, getting it to thrive on the sort of uh, rugged limestone landscape where ash it, it does very well, even if slow, um, uh, then I think that's a non-starter. But personally, of course, because I like sycamore, I don't see any problem about it replacing ash in situations uh, where uh, it would thrive. And it's worth thinking about, uh, why would you go to Ikea and buy a maple a, a, a sycamore table made in Finland uh, at considerable expense when you could get it made by people who lived in Outwood. Um, uh, one other thing is that some woodlands now have ash in them, uh, but maybe the woodlands could retain essentially their same character uh, without worrying too much about replacing ash. So, for example, upland ash wood is usually a mixture of downy birch, Betula pubescens, ash, and rowan with characteristic associated shrubs or small trees like Prunus pardus, bird cherry. So maybe, and a very nice associated flora in open places, which includes things like wood geranium um, and globe flower. Uh, so maybe you could think that, that doesn't matter too much if ash disappears, provided you retain the canopy. The woodland will look the same. I'm thinking now in wood, of woodlands, say at the upper end of Swaledale, uh, in those little uh, uh, gullies uh, which go up to the lead mining sort of areas. Uh, in those situations, I think ash would not be such a loss. It's in the warmer, drier, craggy landscapes of, um, of Carboniferous limestone, and then in the chalk in the south, where the loss will be most felt. Uh, often in the south, uh, it's on, um, at least these woodlands are on boulder clay, uh, the ash-rich uh, oak ash woodlands uh, with dog's mercury 
Uh, and um, well, uh, I think ash is not often a canopy dominant, but it's, uh, its loss would certainly be felt. That's enough. Great, thank you. Um, so we'll go on to the next question. So this is from Jim O'Neill from the Forestry Commission. And he has asked, how do we factor in climate change requirements into NBC planning? Mm -hmm. So we have to consider which species will be more appropriate in 50 years when planning now. Yeah, that, I think that's a very interesting question. And um, the NVC was clearly um, uh, done at a time when we were uh, looking at woodlands inherited from periods when uh, the climate was uh, um, different to, net, to what it's becoming now, uh, and also perhaps which had been settled for a long time. So there's a degree of stability, accumulated stability, and a, a degree of accumulated response in the woodlands to that stable, uh, different uh, climate. And of course, we're talking about difference in uh, in different parts of the country. The climate is going to be different. Uh, so I think adaptations to climate change will be rather varied. So in some places, perhaps we're thinking about how a tree is going to stand a great longer summer drought. How are they going to cope with um, uh, other kinds of uh, high levels of uh, soil moisture and so on? So it's not a simple. Uh, thing across uh, the country. Uh, I, I, people often think, because I'm, uh, people think of me as Mr. NVC, but I have no vested interest in the woodlands of the UK remaining exactly as they are in the NVC. The woodlands we've got are the result of a complicated story of deliberate planning, selfishness, serendipity, all sorts of uh, economic and social changes have bequeathed to us the woodlands we've got. And I find, I used to find it very hard uh, telling students and people on training courses, almost none of the vegetation we value for its wildlife interest was created by conservation management. So to do this by conservation management, to do this by deliberate forestry now and to keep what we've got, uh, this may be a losing battle. What we need to think about is being adaptive to climate change and maybe creating woodlands which will be sustainable, which are different to the ones we know now. For, that's not a crime, but it, it is something which when one's working with the people I call the eco-Taliban, uh, it's, it's quite a difficult battle to win. So there are trees which are much more adapted to drier climate than others. I mean, if, if you take on the southern chalk, for example, uh, horse chestnut is an introduction from the Balkans uh, in the 17th century, uh, which was uh, brought here for ornamental purposes. But it has found exactly the right home on the cliffs of um, the chalk uh, mixed in with beech and ash. OK, the ash may go. Uh, so that's a tree which may uh, do quite well. Uh, it has its own problems, of course, with, with chestnut blight. All the chestnuts in my street have disappeared in the last 20 years. But anyway, that, that's another question. Uh, box. Box is uh, hugely impressive on the hot, sunny cliffs of Burgundy. Uh, at the moment in Britain, it may even not be native, but it thrives very locally on places like Box Hill, uh, on south-facing slopes, with yew which I always think is a rather improbable uh, uh, heat, the heat tolerant tree, but it nonetheless is. So I think there's all sorts of opportunities for thinking about trees, which maybe even at the moment are not native, uh, which would thrive, and which may also, as well as being of biodiversity interest, uh, yield you a crop. Uh, what we need is a more flexible attitude, I would say, and, and in a way, you, the constituency here, gathered together, uh, you're in the best position to persuade people that conservation can be combined with productivity. But my goodness, what a lesson that, that people in the rest of the conservation world need to learn, that we need new methods of farming which combine a productive income for farmers with biodiversity interest. We don't need to pay them simply to maintain museums of the things we cherish now. Rant over. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, so I've got a couple more questions. Are you happy just to, to yeah, keep? Yeah, yeah, yes, I'm okay. Carrying on. Well, so um, just wanted to check you. You're still with us. That's great. Um, so this is from Tim Oliver, who works for the Mersey Forest um, over um, one of the community forests for um, yep. that region. Um, so he says there appears to be a gulf developing between nature conservationists and foresters, where in practice the current emphasis on the environment should see us working closer together. Has John any thoughts and advice on how to bridge this gap? Mm, well, um, <laughs> that's sort of where I finished my last uh, uh, response, actually. Yes, and, and this depresses me greatly, actually. Um, and it's a I think it's also a gulf between nature conservationists and farmers or nature conservationists and other whole groups that 
Um, for too long, uh, I think there's been a, a, a vested interest in, in what we have, which is very important. No, nobody should think that I am not in favour of maintaining um, uh, high quality meadows, for example, beautiful. I've worked on the hay meadows of the North Pennines and they are stunning and everything should be done to try and maintain this kind of vegetation in one way or another. Uh, but we don't want little museums of interesting vegetation in between which is a whole layer of a uh, whole sort of stretch of uh, boring stuff. And uh, I think one for me, one way of bridging the gap is that there's a campaign called Save Our Beautiful, Save Our uh, Marvelous Meadows. And that's great. I support it. Um, I'm subscribed. Uh, but uh, I wanted to start another campaign called uh, Save Our Mediocre Meadows, uh, because, in fact, a lot of the freedom for developing interesting vegetation comes in the stuff which isn't of high value at the moment. So one way of bridging the gap is getting foresters and nature conservationists to work together on places which aren't at the present precious, but which could have biodiversity and other values in the future. So you've got more options in this middle ground. You, you can't do anything with a northern hay meadow except continue managing it as it's been managed probably for let's say decades and centuries uh, by uh, uh, pumping money in to persuade farmers to work for biodiversity ends uh, with little other outcome. Um, uh, so um, that that's fine, uh, but it's not the only way of going on. So what we need, uh, and maybe the environmental land management scheme will create opportunities for this. But certainly, I, I think I, I I agree. It's it's not a helpful gap to have between these practitioners. But we need, I think, uh, in the end, we probably need policy frames within which these people are forced to get together and do something different. Uh, we need the prospect of money for both uh, parties. Uh, so farmers need to earn an income, conservationists need to feel there's some benefit from what the farmers are doing. And until we have that sort of uh, uh, frame, which respects the need for people to have the, uh, the self-sufficiency to do what they do well, and yet yield byproducts which are uh, welcomed by other people. Um, so if you can do it locally without any money, uh, then uh, good luck. Great. Okay, so I'll pop on to the next question. We're going to come in thick and fast now. Um, so this is a question from Julie Smith. She works in the Arboriculture Department at Myers Co College. Um, she's recently started a PhD, which will be looking at the biodiversity in the young woodlands planted by the community forests. And she's asked, do you know of any work that has, um, has been undertook to look at the biodiversity, plant and animal of young woodlands in the north of England? No, well, no, I'm not well up in that field, actually, at the minute. I'm, I mean, I'm sure there is some, and I guess you could trawl around for um, examples of this, but it would be beneficial, very beneficial to, to look at this, I think. And um, it, it is exactly the sort of um, uh, field that's very good for PhD research or, or for master's projects, actually. So it would be worthwhile creating a sort of network, I think, if, or for her to create a network of other, other young academics who are working in this field and practitioners to try and get together and make uh, something of it where they could have a website and post their findings and uh, share uh, information about uh, uh, particular places. Um, as I said, I mean, young, young woodland, young woodland st can start off being quite, if you're planting, I mean, uh, quite rich because if you're planting among something which is already interesting, then you've got a whole load of, uh, of diversity there. It's in the middle years when the canopy closes that things can go um, uh, down in terms of the biodiversity because of the uh, closure of, you know, occlusion of, of light and so on. Uh, but that, that does need, uh, it does need looking at. Um, and with some species, it will occur more quickly than others, of course, because they're more uh, shade casting. Um, other uh, middle year woodlands, if they've got a light canopy uh, with ash, for example, it's not such a problem. So, no, I'm sorry, I can't really provide information about that, but I would urge her to uh, post something and, and create create a, um, a, a platform on which people could share and oh, organise a Zoom conference. And I have said to Julie, she can get in touch with with uh, the Mersey Forest and City of Trees in the north as well. Mm. And to maybe yeah. a collaboration. Right. Um, so the next question is from from the Mersey, Mersey Forest, Carl. Um, how do we balance the need for homegrown timber with the desire to follow the ideal NVC species mix when planting or planning new woodland? 
I think, well, one thing would be to focus on the trees, which you know are going to give the best uh, return in the medium and long term in, in, in terms of uh, the timber, and, and then just use this as a filter um, to impose over the top of the NVC uh, thing. So, uh, I mean, it depends what sort of timber you want, how quickly it's going to grow in particular conditions. But for me, there would be nothing wrong with using uh, the NVC in terms uh, to, to um, uh, combine uh, timber production uh, with biodiversity interest. Um, and uh, that's where the ecological site classification might be useful uh, because it, it, it can give you perhaps a better platform for looking at how, um, uh, ah, it might mean conifers. <laughs> I see <laughs> somebody's posted a chat, which maybe he does mean, con does he mean conifers? Uh, he didn't specify. Okay, well, I'll just stick to what I'm saying. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think there is there is no problem about. Uh, for me, it's not a sacrilege to say. Well, you know, we're, we're interested in timber. We're interested in carbon retention. Okay, so we want quick growth. We want something that's going to lock up more quickly, and we want something which, in the medium to longer term, is going to give us a good return on our investment uh, and uh, some decent quality timber, which we can market with with pleasure. I mean, a bit, a bit this, my sycamore draining boards are, are an ideal example of that, actually. I mean, they turned out to be terrific. Uh, Woodworm, love them. <laughs> Great. So the next question is um, from Glenn, who is the Natural Environment Manager at Leeds City Council. And he said, in our race to capture and lock up carbon by 2050, do we have time to rely on natural regeneration? No, I would say, and probably probably, uh, probably not even time to rely on planting, actually. I mean, tre trees can grow pretty slowly, can't they? So uh, there mustn't be any obfuscation of this. You, you don't want to be planting so many trees and saying, well, ultimately they'll do this and, well, we can make a trade-off and that means we're capturing this much carbon. But it, it will be a problem using trees to, to meet these targets, I think. Um, and uh, my colleagues who work on uh, Blanket Box say, uh, well, we've got a much better return on spending a lot of money on stopping the excessive drainage of blanket box because they're so much better at keeping the carbon. Uh, and there are other hidden sources of carbon retention, aren't there? Soils, for example, themselves, uh, salt marshes. Uh, these things may actually, when you get down to it, be much better at uh, catching the carbon. If we can create more coastal salt marsh, for example, this may be better than planting the equivalent hectares of trees. But uh, I think that's why uh, it's important to balance off as a little cartwheel of uh, things that uh, um, uh, Paul showed at the beginning. It's important to balance off these carbon retention benefits and not be too unrealistic uh, about it uh, with, uh, uh, with, with other benefits. Um, but uh, no, I think, I think they're, they're, they'll be equally, it depends what trees you're dealing with, but I think they might be equally problematic in delivering uh, the 2050 or 2040 or 2030 target. Great. Okay. Um, are you happy to take a couple more? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. So this is from a small woodland owner. Um, could we be excluding ash of the future from resistant strains by overplanting with ash substitutes now? Hmm. Well, that's interesting, actually. As to, I mean, uh, ash is a light demanding tree. Uh, and it, it generally doesn't get a chance to escape unless there's a real gap in the canopy. Uh, sycamore, for example, uh, is quite a dense shading tree and produces this horrible soapy litter, which many people object to. So I don't like that about sycamore. Um, but there may be other uh, there may be other uh, overplant trees for overplanting, which cast sufficiently light shade to allow ash to um, thrive in the meantime, or just manage the woodland so that you're periodically taking out cuts, uh, which allow uh, the the um, uh, um, ash which is uh, uh, resistant uh, to come through but that's that's an interesting idea actually to how we might plant now uh, to enable an opportunity for ash in the future it's a mid to longer term objective but there, there would be uh, there, there would be uh, um, uh, I think ways of doing that it's it's an interesting thing so in principle I think that's a very nice idea but you'd have to be careful about what trees you uh, were planting over the top if ash was to uh, uh, to sit there and come through. I mean, beach is such a uh, beach will sit happily for 40, 50 years underneath itself, uh, just waiting for an opportunity for the parent to fall over, a bit like my grandchildren, you know, uh, and then they'll spring up and take my place uh, and the youngsters will take the beach's place. But ash is not like that. 
it, it, it will not uh, it will not tick over in that sort of way. Great. Right. OK, um, and we've got a question from Brian Cosgrove, who is from City of Trees. Um, might NVC help to bridge the gap between woodland creation for carbon incentives like the Woodland Carbon Code and the biodiversity net gain approach to mitigating impact of development on biodiversity? Yes, it might. And I can only answer that really generally because I don't know the ins and outs of these uh, uh, sort of um, calculation, the schemes for calculation and reward that these two approaches uh, meet. But I think in general, there's no doubt, I think, that you, you can uh, have both these benefits um, and there may be trade-offs in one particular situation as opposed to another. So you're getting more in one place, more in another. But I think the great advantage of some trees is that you can talk about the benefits in this sort of way. Uh, that they can be phenomenally good, quick growing trees in terms of um, uh, their carbon, uh, locking up the carbon. Uh, that can create timber, which uh, newcomers can uh, uh, then replace. Uh, but also along the way, you get biodiversity benefits. But what we need is perhaps uh, with this pressure, well, it's quite some pressure. It's only 30 years ago, 30 years ahead, even if you take the 2050 target. Um, but that's quite some pressure to begin to do some calculations, to look at particular trees and think, well, you know, uh, how might that be the case? But there should be enough information about uh, in trees of known age uh, where you're able to calculate uh, how long they've been there, how much carbon they've got, and what associated biodiversity there is. So it would be really good to have some uh, information uh, about that. Great. So this is another sort of ash related question. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, the, this is from Damien Hughes. Um, so it's the thoughts on planting elms or small leaved lime to replace mm. ash, especially mm. in the Derbyshire Dales. Mm. Well, uh, I'm so glad somebody's mentioned small leaved lime, actually, because it's a favourite tree of mine. And uh, um, I was just wondering if there'd be a question about this. Uh, yes, I think that's a very interesting possibility. Um, small leaf lime is, is a quite um, Catholic uh, tree in, um, in its ecological requirements. I mean, it will survive on heavy clay soils as well as on uh, freely draining uh, limestone, unlike large leaf lime, Tilia platyphyllos, which is much more uh, demanding of um, uh, craggy conditions, lime rich conditions, and is therefore more local. Uh, I think it's worth thinking about both those trees, actually. Um, but one, what was the other tree? I, I just got hooked on uh, on small leaf lime. What did what what did you say? Uh, apart from elms. Uh, elm. Yeah, fine. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, let's just so let's just think about uh, uh, lime first. So yeah. So small leaf lime uh, is uh, uh, obviously a different tree to ash. Um, it's a delightful tree, and it has its own sort of comes along with its own sort of cultural interest. Um, and there are woodlands in which lime is dominant, uh, as, and they were well described by Oliver Rackham and George Peterkin. So there's no doubt it can be grown uh, and encouraged with some abundance, as has happened in the past, uh, and it can thrive in a variety of conditions. So the, there may be something to be said uh, for uh, using it. It's um, it's quite. Uh, I mean, you're all uh, more or less working in the lowlands, so it, it's it's a lowland tree, essentially, like Tilia platyphyllos, which is much uh, rarer. Um, and uh, um, uh, so I'll come back to lime in a minute. Uh, but, uh, elm, yeah, elm. Uh, well, Ulmus glabra uh, it, here, uh, when I uh, first came to the northwest of England, uh, Ulmus glabra was still surviving quite happily, uh, uh, witch elm, and then it uh, disappeared gradually. Uh, but it has come back, um, I'm pleased to say, uh, and seems to have this sort of ability to sprout uh, anew, uh, unlike the uh, limes, characteristic of the southern agricultural landscape, almost prosera, for example. Um, so uh, that's a possibility, but but it is it is a bit uh, different to ash. It's more um, uh, humidity demanding, and it's uh, that's why it's a northern and western tree. So it stands drought uh, less well uh, than uh, ash does, um, and so that might be uh, uh, an, an important thing to think about. Yeah, but both those trees, I mean. It, they, I think if they were to replace ash in many woodlands with ash, uh, the overall impression that the woodland had uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be very different because they both occur widely with ash now uh, in, in these woodlands. Uh, ash and elm uh, is a very characteristic sort of mixture. So to have more elm if it were resistant to um, its own diseases would be fine. Uh, it, with small leaf lime, I think um, that, that it would be very nice. There's, there's always an argument about lime as to where you get the, you know, what the provenance of the, of the stuff is. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's an immensely long lived tree. 
That's the other nice thing about lime. The limes in the southern part of the Lake District uh, easily uh, uh, outlive the the um, uh, the ewes. Actually, in in on the eastern Coniston woodlands, for example, you can see limes which are probably a millennium old uh, sitting in these uh, ravines. Uh, immensely kind of. Uh, uh, characterful trees. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's a little sideline, but I'm very attached to them in that sort of situation. Great, thank you. Um, so moving on, this is from Mike Norbury, who's also from the Mersey Forest. Um, how could we incorporate suitable conifers into a planting mix? The mm. evidence I've seen on transpiration rates is favourable from a natural flood management point of view. Ah, oh, that's an interesting point. I, I'm not sure about the second, more technical part of the question, but uh, many of the woodlands we looked at in, in the NVC survey did have some conifers in them, um, and often uh, not native on a particular spot, well, almost always not native, um, uh, things like um, um, uh, Douglas fir and so on, are often present in small numbers. I mean, the problem with conifers is they're perpetually shading, apart from larch and, uh, and other introduced uh, conifers, uh, so uh, that's a killer for um, uh, for light demanding herbaceous plants like bluebell, uh, for example. Uh, but uh, as part of a mixture, I think there's, for me, there's no problem. And the diversity of uh, mixed woodlands like that is often very congenial for things like red squirrel, uh, for example, uh, and other, uh, and some birds. Um, so uh, in, in occasional conifers within those sorts of mixes isn't a problem, I think, in many of the uh, woodlands, um, particularly the low mixed broadleaf bluebell woodland um, and the mixed uh, broadleaf ash uh, maple um, uh, dog's mercury woodland. Uh, but in numbers, of course, then, and especially in close density, they're, they're a problem. Um, I, I don't know enough about their uh, transpiration and flood resilience at all, actually. Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, one doesn't associate conifers with um, uh, floodplain uh, woodlands uh, in this country at least, so I simply couldn't say. Great, um, so moving on, we've got uh, Gary Primrose, lovely name, um, who's a private <laughs> woodland owner in Cumbria, and he's asked you, John, what is your view about bramble invasion when creating new native woodland? Uh, well, it depends uh, what situation uh, you're in, actually, because um, uh, bramble can play a part in woodland development because it sheds its leaf litter and it's quite nutrient rich. Uh, of course, I mean it's a bit of a competitor. If you're wanting, if you're if you're into planting in bramble, that's a real problem because you have to think about how the youngsters are going to get away. Um, but I, I, I think it, uh, it most bramble. Well, many brambles are shade sensitive, of course, so they don't survive under a, a, a deep. Uh, a dense canopy, uh, so they're associated with the with the outskirts of a woodland. Uh, but but I don't I don't um, in, in, to my mind a mixed landscape of woodland scrub and subscrub with with a, an element of bramble uh, is is fine. And the, the bramble can make a resurgence if there are gaps in a woodland. I mean, it's it's a, a very good example of this would be in uh, the sort of beech woods that you have on soils of some fertility. So that's uh, a, a beach sort of bluebell woodland, except there are hardly any bluebells because the beach is so densely shading. Uh, but, but when a beach falls over, it's often replaced in such woodlands by oak. Uh, and what you're talking about is, I mean, a cycle of perhaps two or three hundred years. And the oak comes in and survives, uh, thrives, because bramble comes in and the uh, litter uh, decays and creates soil conditions which are more congenial. So the soil moves from being a moda, as it would be called, that is a, a rather impoverished brown earth, to being a mole soil, uh, largely a result of the invasion of bramble. So bramble, I think, can be beneficial on soils which are poorer in providing a measure of enrichment, which you don't need to tinker with uh, artificially. Uh, but clearly the competition for young trees uh, is, is formidable. Um, the other thing about bramble, of course, it's very attractive to browsers. And grazers. So if you, you know, if you're keen, if if you're keen to attract a seeker or roe deer into your woodlands, then bramble might be quite a nice meal to lay on for them, uh, that, which is a, a real problem. I don't know whether that goes near the question. Yeah, I'm sure it does. Um, so this is a question from Andy from City of Trees. He said, "Bulletin one one two. I assume mm -hmm. you know what that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Caution to planting rarer native species such as limes, wild service, etc. Is this caution yes. still as relevant today as we look 
for other native species to diversify our woods, even if the conditions seem suitable. Yeah, and it, and it cautions because of the anxiety about um, keeping the native distribution pattern. Uh, really, that, that's what uh, conservationist anxieties were, that if you if you start planting small leaf lime out with its native range, uh, then this sort of confuses the natural pattern. Uh, with climate change, uh, that may be less of an anxiety and um, less something that we, we should worry about, certainly. But I, 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 I am sensitive to the, um, the concern about provenance. Uh, often importing uh, uh, youngsters of uh, young trees uh, from other countries has brought disease in, which one needs to always be careful of. Uh, but in principle, in principle, uh, I'm not necessarily against planting trees in places where they have not so far thrived. It depends what you're trying to do and uh, just just how worried you are. I'm I'm, I'm always conscious about um, the rhetoric of native versus non-native because it takes on a, a, a tone which I find um, uh, well it shades into other kinds of conversations about who doesn't belong here. I was once teaching a group of students in in uh, from Leeds in a woodland outside Ilkley, and we were talking about sycamore actually. And I, I, I we looked at the sycamore in the wood. It's the most frequently reproducing tree in the wood, and th uh, set to take over from oak after another hundred years or so. And I, I, I outlined the geology, the biology of, of sycamore. And this very ardent young man uh, said. Um, uh, we don't want this kind of tree here. Uh, it's not British. Uh, it breeds faster than uh, native trees. And it's just squeezing out the things we love so much. And this guy was standing next to some Bain Muslim guy from Burnley in this group. And I, I turned to this guy and said, what, what interesting language this, isn't it? And you, you might think this comparison is trivial, but I think, I think the, the virulence with which people oppose sycamore when I've met them, Sycamore, for example, to go back to that, uh, does shade into this sort of uneducated attitude to uh, what's really British. And uh, climate change and other things may force us uh, to uh, think again about this. Uh, I mean, uh, we just need to be a bit more relaxed, I think, about what might be planted where, so long as we remember the inherited patterns. Uh, and lime is, is quite a good example in this respect. Uh, planting widely things which are very rare that needs uh, an additional sort of uh, caution, I think, like large leaf line. Great. So we've just had some comments in the chat, just following up on some of the questions, um, right. which is great. Um, so I think everyone can kind of read those. So I think that's all our questions um, that have come through in the chat. Uh, John, um, hopefully you're not too <laughs> scattered <laughs> by that. But yes, yeah, some really interesting and uh, array of questions. Um, so I think that's everything from everyone, unless anyone has any final questions and John's got time to answer those. Um, I think that's all from everyone. Okay. Great. Okay, so looks okay. Like that's all. Um, so Paul, I don't know if you want to do a bit of a sort of roundup um, just to add, we are um, recording the session. We have been recording the session. So we're going to get that sorted and, and probably pop that either on a public YouTube or private YouTube link. Um, and um, John's very kindly said that we can um, PDF the presentation and send that round to any colleagues who may have missed it. And there's a bit of a follow up. So that's very kind of him. So um, if anyone wants to email me, I can sort that out. It'll probably be next week now before we get the video sorted. Um, I'll just hand over to Paul now just to say a few final comments and thank you to everyone for attending. Hope you found that really interesting. Yeah, th thanks, Sarah. And uh, yeah, huge, huge thanks, John. I, that was, uh, for me, a huge privilege. I mean, I, I've got to come to work today, got paid to listen to that. Makes me remember why I love this job. So, so thank you. But it also makes me want to, to rewind 35 years or so and go back to uni and kind of study all those things that you're talking about so, so we can so I, um, embed them even better. So yeah, a huge, huge thank you, John. And um, and thanks everybody to, who's, who's asked the questions and who's come along this afternoon. John, I hope you can um, continue to join us on our journey as we try to get trees and woodlands rewilding, you know, wilding or planted, but, but mostly thinking about you know, how, we're, how we're doing the best job we can for, for future generations and, and, and giving something back both to, to nature, but also remembering those stories. I mean, that, that great link back to to medieval times and the, and the Collinsons, etc., I think is is what community forest is all about. Trying to recreate those those links with the past, engaging people with their with their natural environment, 
and trying, trying to create places that that are thriving and uh, and cherished so yeah for me yeah thank you very much everything we could have expected um thank you for answering all those questions you've been on a good couple of hours so probably divert, deserve a, a cup of coffee or a cup of tea now so yeah, thank you john thank Great. you thank you everyone and, and feel free to drop me an email if you want to to follow up with anything and i can make sure i send that link out um, so we'll um, we'll end the session now. But thank you, everyone, and, and thanks, John. And we'll follow up with um, with all the details uh, hopefully next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, John. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye now.